Good evening uh, to everyone, and uh, uh, I'm very glad to uh, be with you uh, this evening to uh, share about uh, my topic today, facts and myths uh, about the Hebrew language. Uh, be before going deeper into that, uh, just a quick introduction uh, about myself. Actually, Hani has done uh, her detective work. Uh, presumably, I, I was actually uh, very surprised that, that she knew so much about me. And then I thought, wait, this is all on LinkedIn, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yes, uh, I uh, did my diploma in information technology uh, in Singapore Polytechnic, uh, focusing, uh, specializing in game development. Okay. And then uh, after which uh, I went to the University of Southampton for my bachelor's in computer science uh, with a scholarship from the Land Transport Authority, which is why I am currently working with them as a software engineer. Um, uh, since 2017, and uh, you see here a photo of me, I am presenting an app which I developed uh, for, for my agency. Um, so just in case you're wondering, wait, 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 uh, is this the correct Asher Chi? Uh, yes, 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 it is. Um, I went back uh, after my bachelor's degree to study for uh, my a, um, a master's in history, uh, same university, uh, and again, uh, doing a focusing on uh, Jewish and Christian history, all right? The, the story is uh, very uncanny, okay? It was during my bachelor's years, actually the last year, when I was idly exploring my university's uh, library and I found out, and I didn't know this when I enrolled, right? I found out that uh, my, my university specialized in Jewish history. Didn't know that, all right? But by some providence, you know, um, I found myself back in Southampton doing uh, my master's degree. And on the first day already, uh, my professor asked me, you know, uh, do you want to do a PhD? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so uh, that is what I'm doing concurrently as well. Um, apart from that, I am also the, well, president of Zealous Ministries, uh, which is a, a, a website a ministry that I'm running. Feel free to take a look at it, uh, zmin.org. Uh, we can talk about that uh, later. Um, so, the, uh, the, the common question I get, so then what inspired me to learn Hebrew and Greek and Latin, right, uh, because that's a related language? Well, you see, uh, many years ago, when I was uh, 15 years old, uh, my parents brought me to New Creation Church, right, uh, pastored by this guy, Joseph Prince. Now, one of Joseph Prince's main selling points was that he knew the biblical languages, right? So, uh, you know, I, I was I was an awestruck follower of Joseph Prince, right? So, and and I was impressed at how he used the biblical languages to justify his interpretations. And so I thought, you know, fifteen year old me said, well, he knows Hebrew and Greek, so then his interpretations must be more correct than other pastors and teachers, right? M makes sense, right? So, and, and that was what really uh, inspired me, right? I was I was really uh, impressed with him, and I started to learn. Hebrew and Greek. And uh, one, the, the thing that actually launched me into that was this uh, DVD uh, entitled Aleph Tav, Jesus' Signature in the Bible. And uh, for those of you who have seen some of my videos that I've made, uh, you know what that is about, all right? But this is what actually started me uh, learning Hebrew and Greek. But as I learned, you know, even at a basic level, um, I started to realize that there is actually a lot of misinformation and misconception floating around in Christian circles. And that, you know, began my journey and mission to try to correct that uh, within the body of Christ. Okay. And so today, you know, uh, we're going to talk about uh, facts and myths about the Hebrew language. Now, why is this important? Well, if you think about it, a reasonable interpretation of a biblical passage depends largely on a responsible treatment of the original texts, right? The Bible did not come to us in uh, King James English, right? Uh, it didn't drop from the sky, you know, in, in that book form with that red bookmark, no, right? Uh, it came to us in the original languages of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, okay? And if, if, uh, if you're aware, most of the arguments, uh, not, not most, but many arguments that are coming from people who want to overthrow biblical truths uh, are based 
on the biblical languages. So maybe you have heard some things like this before, you know, like, uh, uh, oh, this, this, uh, this Greek word here doesn't actually mean homosexual, right? Uh, the word homosexual wasn't inserted into the Bible until only much later. You may have heard something like that, right? And most of us, we don't know how to respond to that because, well, we, we don't know any better. Right. And, so I, and so that's why I think it's so important for us, well, especially pastors and teachers, to know how to discern uh, between fact and myth, fact and fiction. So, by the way, all the things that I'm covering today don't actually require you to have a deep and scholarly understanding of the Hebrew language. It just requires common sense. Right? Uh, only the details will require some knowledge of Hebrew. Okay, and you, you will see this uh, as, as I go along. So um, let's begin with some facts about the Hebrew language before we, we go into the myths, okay? And um, don't know how familiar you are with these facts, uh, but let's go into the first one. Fact number one, Hebrew was a common Canaanite language. Mm. And what that means is that we have to remember uh, that the land of Israel, the, the, the promised land which Israel came to possess, was the land of Canaan and was inhabited by the Canaanite tribes, the Canaanite nations, long before Israel entered the land and conquered it under Joshua, right? And so these Canaanite peoples, they spoke, um, well, presumably the Canaanite languages, right? And um, these languages being in the same area, they are more or less similar, all right? There are some minor differences here and there, but they are more or less, I would say, dialects of one another, all right? So when Israel came into the land, okay, um, essentially what we call Hebrew today is actually just the version of the Canaanite languages that the Israelites used, okay? So in other words, Hebrew was not some, you know, uh, special uh, language that, was, that appeared out of thin air, no. It was a continuation of the Canaanite languages that was already there, in fact, even before Abraham came into Canaan. In fact, the Hebrew language is never called Hebrew in the Hebrew Bible. You won't find it. How do you call Hebrew in, in Hebrew? Rivrit, right? You might know this. Do a search. You won't find the word, the, the word Rivrit in the Hebrew Bible. You won't find it. Instead, what do you find? What did the Israelites call their language? Do you know? Well, we have an attestation of it in Isaiah chapter 19, verse 18, right? And uh, they called their language Sephat Kenaan, the language of Canaan. You see, the Israelites did not perceive their language as some special holy language. No, they, they perceived their language as coming, as being a property of the land. It belonged to the land, it belonged to the peoples of the land. And when we came in, we just started speaking that language that was already there, okay? Um, now, as you know, Israel came to dominate the promised land, the, the land of Canaan. They built a kingdom, which then got split into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, eventually, the southern kingdom of Judah gained prominence, right? And the land became known as Judah uh, or Yehuda in, uh, in, in, in the Persian rule and later on, Judea under Roman rule, okay? And so during the time of the ex exile, okay, um, they, they called the language Yehudit, Jewish, or in your translations, it will say la language of Judah, all right? But the word there, Yehudit, all right, comes from Yehuda, it's Judah's name, right? So Jewish, <laughs> it's literally Jewish, all right? The language is literally called Jewish. All right, um, but uh, the English translations will say language of Judah. So notice they never called it Hebrew. All right, the tradition of calling it Hebrew came later on uh, during the Greek era, where they they called the language um, Evraisti, okay, Hebrew. Um, in fact, so because Hebrew is a Canaanite language, all right, um, you can act, uh, it is. It, it is, bears a lot of similarities to the Canaanite languages, right? Which means that actually um, Canaanite inscriptions written by the Canaanite peoples can be read by someone who knows biblical Hebrew. 
Don't believe me? I'll make one of you read it in a moment. This is the Mesha Stele, all right? It was written by a Moabite king named Mesha. Okay, uh, if I do a little zoom in, you will see here, uh, my, uh, it's, this is a uh, drawing, a, a re uh, re representation of the inscription, all right? And if, uh, if you can look at it, um, the letters you don't recognize, but actually, these are the same 22 letters mm. that you have in the Hebrew alphabet. It's just a different script. Mm. In other words, I can actually transcribe each Hebrew letter, all right, into uh, the, the script that we are all familiar with. That, that's it. Now, now you are familiar with this script. Now you are familiar with these letters. Okay? And maybe you say, oh, I, you know, well, can you make up some words? Can you make out some words? First of all, look at this. Uh, is my mouse visible in, in the thing? Is it? It is? Okay. Uh, look at this, this word here. Bet Nun. What word is this? Ben. Ben. What does it mean? Sun. Sun. Let's look at this other word. Mem Lamed Kaf. What word is this? Next person answer. <laughs> yeah, next person answer. Malak. Melech, what does it mean? King. King. You are reading a Moabite inscription. Huh. Now, all I have to do now is to add the vowels that we are all used to, what I'm doing. So I just modified, I just massaged uh, the, the vowels and the letters a little bit. And now you can read it. Uh, honey, could you help me pick someone to read this? Um, pa uh, Pam? <laughs> yep. Uh, Pam? Can, can Pamela help us read some? Are you uh, there, Pam? Or, or Anela? Anochi, Mesha, Ben, Kemoshi, Melech, Moab. Excellent. Right. Hadivoni. Hadivoni. Okay. Um, so, Anela, or would someone else like to try translating this? Who, who do you think, uh, honey, who, uh, who might be able to translate this? Not on. Okay, just this, this is a. Uh... Oh, Nancy is going to try again. All right, all right. Go for it, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> no, Anoki. Unless someone was. Anoki is I. Misha, that's, uh, that's someone's name. Okay. Yeah. Okay, who is he? Who is Misha? Misha must be the king. Yeah, he's the king. And how does he describe himself? Son. Uh, Son of? Pardon, I didn't get it. Construct. This Son is again of. in yeah, Son, of. Construct. Son of? Son of who? This is another name. Kemoshit. Kemoshit. Kemoshit is a um, Moabite god. You can find him also in the Bible. Okay. And who is Mesha? What, how else does he describe himself? Melech. Mm -hmm. Moab. All right. King what of Moab. King of Moab. All right. And then this is another place name. Adivoni. That's the Dibu, the, the Dibonite. Okay. And that's it. Anochi Mesha ben Kemoshit Melech Moab Adivoni. I am Mesha, son of Kemoshit, king of Moab, the Dibonite. Uh, oh. Who was it that read just now? Nancy. Nancy. No. Uh, was it Nancy, Nancy. who read? Huh? Yeah. Was it? Nancy? Yeah. Oh, Nancy, um, have you been secretly taking Moabite lessons? No. I've been <laughs> How is it that you were able to read a Moabite inscription written by a Moabite king who is writing in the Moabite language? <laughs> I've been following Stephen and learning classes. <laughs> yeah, well, you were able to read it because you have learned Hebrew, all right? And this... This Moabite language, you see, look at that. It's so close to Hebrew that someone who has, you know, learned Hebrew is able to read and translate it and understand it. Okay? So, yeah, that's what I mean by Hebrew is a common Canaanite language. It wasn't a, a special language. You know, it wasn't only the Israelites knew it. No, everyone in the area knew it. It was the English of that area. Okay? 
Okay. Uh, yes, and uh, we can find uh, Mesha mentioned in the Bible as well as his God, Kemosh. Okay. Okay, let's see. Ah, okay. Fact number two, the Hebrew language evolved over time. Now, this is, again, you don't need any scholarly knowledge of Hebrew to know this, right? Every language evolves over time. Uh, the English that Shakespeare spoke is a bit different from the English we speak today, right? Um, you could understand him, right? Uh, what speakers thou, you know, when, when he says this kind of, you, you, you understand what he says, all right? Um, but if you were to raise him from the dead and, you know, uh, talk to him, he may not understand you because our English has since evolved, all right? So, you know, uh, when, I, when, I, uh, when people find out that uh, I learn biblical Hebrew, they ask me, oh, so can you go to Israel and speak to them? And the answer is, well, yes, kind of, right? They will understand me, uh, but it will sound as if Shakespeare was speaking to them, all right? But I might not understand them very well because they have modern words and expressions for things that are not in the Bible. What's the biblical word for ice cream? <laughs> it doesn't exist, right? Um, so yeah, so that's how it's all. And actually, I have actually tried this, right? Um, in, in a Hebrew speaking group, I, I did speak biblical Hebrew to them and they were like, whoa, were you born in Yemen or something, right? Because uh, the, the Jews in Yemen still speak uh, that kind of archaic Hebrew, right? So Hebrew did develop over time, okay? It, the, the Hebrew that the Israelites, uh, the, that modern Israelis speak today was different from the Hebrew that we find in the Bible. Uh, scholars have identified seven uh, stages of uh, Hebrew, right? Archaic Hebrew, early biblical Hebrew, late biblical Hebrew, early postmodern biblical Hebrew, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so when we talk about biblical Hebrew, we are actually talking about stages two and three, right? Early biblical Hebrew and late biblical Hebrew. Yes, even there, you, you, uh, look at the, 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 the books I have listed there, you will find subtle uh, differences between the Hebrew in these books, all right? Uh, you can find uh, archaic Hebrew, all right, in the book of Job. That's the oldest book in the Bible, all right? And Job, if you have tried it before, is one of the most notoriously difficult <laughs> books to read, all right? And parts of the Pentateuch, uh, parts of the Torah, Genesis to Deuteronomy, right? When, especially when they contain uh, uh, songs and ancient poems, so it's very interesting. You, you will see the, uh, the narrative go, right? Uh, you, in, in the early biblical Hebrew that we are familiar with. And then suddenly when they come to a poem, suddenly there are some things that throw us off, right? Um, and we'll see that in a while. Um, but just to point out that when, you're, when you study biblical, you know, biblical Hebrew in a textbook, you only get stages two and three. Even though stage one, archaic Hebrew is sometimes found in... Uh, the Bible as well, all right? So an example of this is uh, the Song of the Sea in Exodus chapter 15. Uh, we remember that this is when the Israelites were crossing the Red Sea. Well, after they crossed the Red Sea, right, and the, uh, and the Egyptians were no longer able to pursue them, right, uh, they sang this song. Uh, Moses sang this song, all right? And in verse 5, we have, uh, uh, we have this. Okay, don't ask me to sing the whole song. Um, but let's see, who can pass this verb for me? Honey, who might be able to pass this verb for me? <laughs> I think we'll ask for volunteers. All right, we'll ask for volunteers. A, yeah, because... Um, yeah, I, I don't know who has learned verbs yet. So. Uh, it's not everyone has gone so far would Angie like to try I mean it's a maybe it's a calf it's a what do you call it uh, what is this yeah the, the second one is what yeah Sa the calf S you mean the you the summit calf and then and the S <laughs> and the M, M. And uh, name. The name, name, name. No, no, no. name. Yeah, I think this is a uh, root word. That, you mean your root word? At least a root word. Right. Um, no. Uh, the, actually, the pronoun suffixes. 
Not sure. Maybe, maybe it's here also that the yacht there. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. So just to let you know, I didn't expect any one of you to be able to answer this. All right. Um, this is actually uh Kav Samech He. Okay. Uh, it's uh, the Piel Yiktol, third uh, person mas uh, masculine plural, and with the uh, third person uh, masculine plural object suffix. Now, none of you would have been able to know this. And the reason is because your textbook doesn't cover this. This is archaic Hebrew. It's not in your textbook. It is not in any Hebrew uh, beginner's course. Okay? Now, how would you form uh, the Pi'ayel Yiktol of Kaf Samech He? How would you form it? If you were to open your textbook and go by that formation, how would you form it? Does, does someone know? Kale, those uh, one C people, mm -hmm. level one C people. The, the he is the weak, the weak, uh, weak, this is a weak verb. Uh. It is, yes. Mm. So how would it look like? We form a yikto. Yeah, pi'ayl, pi'ayl yikto. Okay. No, no. Okay, never mind. Uh, I'll tell you. All right. So, going by your textbooks, way of forming the pi'ayl yiktol of kaf samechi, you will get yechasu. All right, and uh, you can flip back to your textbook, do some review. You will find this yechasu. This is the textbook way of forming it. Mm. Right, and then when you, if you were to add the uh, third masculine plural objective suffix, you will get yechasum. Okay, yechasum. This is the way it should be formed according to your Hebrew textbook. But look at, look at the song, yechasumu. Why the difference? And the difference is because this is archaic Hebrew. This is an ancient poem, right? So, and, and, and the, the, the writer of Exodus has preserved the original form uh, as much as he can of, the, of this ancient poem. And that is why we find a form here that will, you know, if you read this on your own, you'll get, oh, uh, what is this? You will flip your textbook in vain to find it because your textbook only covers stages two and three, early biblical Hebrew and late biblical Hebrew. It does not cover um, archaic Hebrew. Okay? Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, yes, Hebrew writing involved as, uh, evolved as well. All right, to the right, you see the Hebrew alphabet, uh, the, the Hebrew writing that we are all familiar with. You could probably read this. This is the, uh, the Shema in the Mezuzah, right? Um, uh, Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Ehad. I, I had to hold back myself from pronouncing the uh, tetragrammaton. <laughs> um, but on the left, you see the Siloam inscription. This is how Hebrew was written during the time of the kings. If you raised King David from the dead and you gave him your Hebrew Bible to read, he would stare blankly at you. He, he would not recognize the letters in your Hebrew Bible because during his time, the letters looked very different. And if you notice, the letters of the Hebrew alphabet during the time of David looks eerily like the lettering on the Moabite stele, isn't it? And indeed, the Israelites we're using the same uh, writing system, okay? So, so let's not get all romantic about the, the form of the Hebrew letters that we have today and you know, try to sniff some significance out of it, right? Because that wasn't original, okay? Okay, um, fact number three, there were different dialects of Hebrew. Mm. Okay, so... And this one, again, no need for any scholarly knowledge of Hebrew because we know that even in languages, there are dialects, right? If I say I speak Chinese, sometimes people will ask which Chinese, right? Uh, that's Mandarin, the Cantonese, uh, Fujian, and, and, and all that. And the case was similar with Hebrew, all right? Um, so there, there is this question, a very valid question, which Hebrew? 
Okay, uh, and we find evidences of this uh, dialectical differences all the way back uh, during the Giladite Ephraimite War. You can read this in uh, Judges 12, right? Um, when uh, hmm. there was a war between Gilad and Ephraim, all right? And yeah. so at, at one point, the Ephraimites were trying to cross over this bridge to get into Giladite land, all right? And so the Giladites would challenge the, the crosser and say, are you an Ephraimite? They said, nope, nope, I'm not the enemy. I'm a fellow Giladite. And so the, 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 uh, the Giladite will ask, okay, say Shibolet. All right, and because mm -hmm. of the, the dialectical differences, uh, the, the Ephraimite will say Sibolet. And he's Sila. <laughs> <laughs> Slice right. off the head. Yeah, exactly. So look at this. This already back then, there were dialectical differences between uh, among the Israelites with regard to the Hebrew language, right? So it wasn't just one monolithic Hebrew. There were different kinds, different dialects of Hebrew. We find further evidence of this in say, okay, no, let, let's do this. It's exam time. And you are asked to write down the preposition al with the second person feminine singular. All right, honey, who might, who might know how to do this? There's a few. Volunteers, please. <laughs> Volunteers, please. Is it hey with the mapik? Uh, that is uh, third person feminine singular. Oh, yeah, that is true. Uh, okay. Uh, with, uh, this one, Shur Shurek. Shurek, no. So, uh, just to be clear, the translation will be upon you. Speaking to one uh, feminine entity, upon you. How would you say that? Okay, yeah. Kaf with a shua. Kaf with a shua. Yeah. Kaf with a shiva. Right? Yeah. So, okay, so, so yes. So fit with a shiva. So if you were taking an exam, you would have written alaih and you would have been marked correct. Right? But if you were taking this exam in northern Israel and you wrote this, um, you might be accused of being a southern spy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right? And we find this in Psalm 116. Oh. Adonai Gamal Alaihi. So right? it's a different representation. There is a difference. And, and you, you as a Hebrew reader, right? You look, ki Adonai gamal alaihi, and you're like, what is this alaihi? You, know, you, you flip through your textbook in vain. You can't find it. Why? Your textbook only teaches you Southern Hebrew. Okay? The, remember, the Southerners won. And history is dominated by the victors, right? So, and that is why most of the Bible is written primarily in the Southern dialect. And only here and there, we find traces of the Northern dialect. In the case of Psalm 116, we find it, it, it's as if the whole Psalm is a Northern composition, right? So we have Yehoshia, and you look at it like, I, I have never learned this form. And indeed you haven't, you would have recognized Yoshia. You would recognize that, you won't recognize uh, Yehoshia, right? Um, and look at the, uh, Okay, so the, 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 the difference is in the uh, uh, second feminine singular suffix, isn't it? Chi, right? And look how uniform it is. Limnu hai chi. That's again the second feminine singular suffix in Northern Hebrew, right? We find alai chi, we have discussed that. Um, Dagmu lohi, and you're like, what is this Dagmu lohi? And this is, simpler, this is simply the third masculine singular objective suffix. You would normally, in Southern Hebrew, you would say Gemulo, his bounty. In Northern Hebrew, you would say Tagmulohi. And again, notice the, uh, the difference in even the, the dictionary form. Hmm. Uh, lastly, we have, uh, we have here Betochechi. All right, notice the Chi again, second feminine singular. In Southern Hebrew, in, in, in textbook Hebrew, you would write Betochech. Yeah? Hmm. Okay. Even more interesting, we find in the book of Kings, right? We find Eli Elisha speaking Northern Hebrew. Why? He is a Northern Israelite. Okay, uh, so 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 7. All right, he says to the widow, Go, sell the oil and pay your debts. Nishyechi. And what's, what's Nishyechi? 
right? Uh, and you and your sons can live on the rest. Your sons, Banaihi, Banaihi, Banana. I, I, Google, right? Um, so we don't know Banaihi, but usually in Southern Hebrew and in the Hebrew we learn from our textbooks, we would say Banaih, your sons. Banaih. But here, Elisha says Banaihi because he's speaking in a Northern dialect. And actually, it's very interesting because this is what you find in the, in the biblical text itself. But a later Hebrew editor actually went through all these uh, instances in the book of Kings, in the, yeah, in the book of Kings, and he corrected it. <laughs> he corrected the, the word to the southern dialect. And so we will find in the Tere reading, you will find Nishiech uh, and Uvanaich. You will find the correct uh, southern rendering of it. But in the text, Right, the editor, when, when he edits the text, he will leave the original behind. So the original says Banaihi, but he will edit it and he'll say, I, I, did, I made some additions, I am very honest. All right? um, and he, he, he will correct it for the understanding of his uh, southern um, audience. Okay? So, yes, uh, that was our three, uh, three facts. Uh, how am I doing for time? Good, okay. okay. You can I'll take us, yeah. Okay, okay. So now we move to the myths. Now, uh, when we come to the myths, we will see that actually what is very useful is that we know the facts. Facts help you to combat myths, right? Let's see the first one. Myth number one, Hebrew is a special holy language. And 90% of all myths about the Hebrew language are based on this myth that Hebrew is a special holy language because then once you frame Hebrew in such a way that it is a special holy language, you know, there is some expectation that Hebrew works in some wonky way which no other language works in. You see, right? And then, you know, so when, when you say things like, oh, the, the Hebrew letters have meaning and all that, people buy into that because they don't see that Hebrew is a common language as it was. Right. So when people say, oh, Hebrew is a special holy language, I, I ask them, which Hebrew? You see, once you know the facts, right, that Hebrew evolved and that there are different dialects of Hebrew, now you can, now, now some things don't make sense when they are told to you and you can identify them straight away as myths. Which Hebrew? Archaic, early biblical, late, late biblical, modern Israeli Hebrew? Which Hebrew? In terms of dialect, which Hebrew is the holy language? Northern Hebrew or Southern Hebrew? The Bible has both, right? All of a sudden, it doesn't make sense. Now, this idea that Hebrew is a holy language did not even exist during the time of Jesus, okay? Um, uh, Luke chapter 4, we have this uh, well-known uh, story where Jesus goes up and he reads from a scroll of Isaiah, okay? Now, what language do you suppose that scroll was written in? Most people... Or Aramaic? Aramaic? Hebrew or Aramaic, right? That's very natural. But think about where that comes from. Think about where that comes from. Well, um, first of all, oh, well, I'll, I'll leave this to a, to a later point. But, okay, and it's very natural because nowadays we are very used to seeing, um, you know, uh, in, in synagogues, Jews will read from a Hebrew scroll. And indeed, the original language of Isaiah, right? Isaiah was written originally in Hebrew. So it would be natural to think that Jesus, when he was standing on that stage in the synagogue, he was reading a Hebrew scroll. But they were right? under Roman rule. Um, yeah, many, uh, and that consideration as well. But if we take a look at the evidence, if we do a comparison between what Jesus read and what was actually in the Hebrew text of Isaiah 61, which he was reading from, you would see some noticeable differences, right? And I've highlighted the differences here in the colors, okay? And actually, the text that Jesus read conforms more closely to known Greek versions of Isaiah 61 than the Hebrew text itself, which indicates to us what? Jesus was most probably reading from a Greek scroll, rather than a Hebrew scroll. He knew Hebrew, for sure, right? But in, on that stage, the evidence points us 
uh, to the fact, the probability that he was reading from a Greek scroll. You see, because uh, as uh, Honey pointed out, they were under Roman rule. And actually 300 years before, there is something, there is someone called Alexander the Great who conquered the whole Mediterranean world and spread the Greek language and culture all over, all right? And so essentially Greek became the international language of the Mediterranean world. It became the English of that world, as you might say. And so Jesus and his disciples would converse primarily in Greek. And even in synagogue services, it was perfectly okay and acceptable to read the scriptures in Greek, which everyone understood. And in fact, even in, um, in, in a Jewish uh, traditional sources, we find that uh, the rabbis allowed uh, prayers to be prayed in Greek rather than in Hebrew, right? This idea that Hebrew is a special holy language came about much, much later on in history, after the coming of Jesus, after the destruction of the temple, okay? Um, okay, so even back then, Jews did not perceive Hebrew as a holy language. Okay, uh, myth number two, the New Testament was written in Hebrew. Might have heard this one. Um, and, and the idea, again, notice how this somewhat links to, to the first myth, right? Why would someone want to claim that the New Testament was written in Hebrew? Well, because, you know, Hebrew is a holy language and New Testament is scripture. The previous scripture was written in Hebrew, so it makes sense that the new scripture would be written in Hebrew, you know? And so people will say things like, ah, you know, all your English translations today are translated from the Greek, but the Greek itself is a translation from the Hebrew. So you won't know what it actually says unless you go back to the original Hebrew. <sighs> okay, so again, this springs from a, you know, a, a lot of very false misconceptions. I think chiefest of all, is that Jesus spoke Hebrew or Aramaic. And you can kind of understand where they're coming from, right? Jesus is a Jew. And therefore, he must have spoken Hebrew or Aramaic, right? Makes sense, right? You think for a moment, actually, that, that sounds kind of racist. Just because he is a Jew, he spoke Hebrew and Aramaic. Look at us. A lot of us here, ethnic Chinese and yet we are speaking to one another in English, right? And here, we in the Southeast Asian region should understand this all the better. And we find even in the New Testament, evidence that uh, Jesus and his disciples were speaking primarily Greek. Um, I have an example here from Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, right? Uh, Jesus says, and I tell you, you are Peter, Greek Petros, and on this rock, Petra, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So, so notice this pun, right? You are Peter, Petros, and on this rock, Petra, I will build my church, right? So this pun is intentional, and it can only happen in Greek rather than Hebrew, okay? Um, also, let's consider the external evidence. How many Greek uh, manuscripts do you suppose we found dating from the first five centuries of, of the common era? How many do you think? Who, who knows? Who might know? Anyone knows? No? Yeah, this is a difficult one. Let's see. I haven't, I haven't been paying pretty attention. Pretty few. To pretty few. Very few. Um, it's about 100. Right? 100. 100 manuscripts from the first um, five centuries. Now, how many Hebrew manuscripts of the New Testament do you suppose we have uh, from this same time period? Make a guess. Five. Five. Anyone else? <coughs> In Hebrew. In Hebrew, yes.
thought there was more in Latin. Oh, there are plenty in Latin. But how about Hebrew? Because we are saying here that the, the New Testament was originally written in Hebrew, right? Hmm. So where, zero. where are all the... Zero. Said zero, you are right. There's zero. Lintan. There's no Hebrew manuscripts of the New Testament, right? So if you, if, if you believe that the New Testament was written in Hebrew, what you are telling me to believe is that the, the first Christians did not bother to preserve the original Hebrew text of the New Testament, but they continued to preserve and copy um, hundreds and hundreds of Greek manuscripts of the New Testament down to our time. That doesn't make sense, right? The evidence does not um, point us this direction, right? It's not reasonable. And we don't, there is no evidence. We don't get the Hebrew text of the New Testament. Excuse me. Excuse me. Right? Yes. The fourth gospel, so some of the writers, they are Jewish people. That's yes. the Definitely, it should be written in Hebrew at the time. Like Dr. Liu, he's a Hebrew, like the Paul, he himself is a Jew, is a you know Jewish. You know? Yeah. So only I believe. I mean, I mean I, I, I assume we need. Okay. Uh, excuse me. Uh, maybe you can uh, put your questions in the chat later. Uh, oh, yeah, we're gonna address it. Yeah, we, we allow Brother Asher to finish his uh, talk. I think you, you can forward a question. We have a Q&A session later. Yeah, okay. thank uh, you. Yeah. Yes. All right. Let's just quickly go on to myth uh, number three, uh, Hebrew letters have meaning. Uh, I think this one is uh, quite, quite a classic. Um, you, you might have seen uh, this kind of chart, right, mm -hmm. where every Hebrew letter is assigned some kind of meaning. Right. Yeah, yeah, proto uh, proto Hebrew, right? And so, how it works is this: uh, you know, for example, we take the word for father, Av, right? Mm. And then, oh, look at that! It's, it is spelled with two Hebrew letters. Mm. The first letter is Aleph. Oh, Aleph means ox, and Bet means house, right? And therefore, the father is the the, the, the leader house. or the strength of the house. Wow! How mystical, right? Well, so a few things we can say about this. Well, first, firstly, it's quite arbitrary, isn't it? Essentially, you are just taking from the, uh, the table on the left and assigning any meaning that you want. Let's, let, let's try it with mother, right? The word for mother, aim. This aleph, again, ox, and mem, which supposedly means water. So perhaps the mother is the... Uh, the leader of the strength of the water, whatever that means. I mean, if I try hard enough, I could, I could spin an explanation, right? Oh, you know, like, uh, oh, this is talking about the water of the womb, you know? Uh, yeah, the baby in the womb, you know, there's water inside. Ah, so the mother is the strength of the water. If I, if, if, if I try hard enough, it was, I mean, did, did, did that sound convincing? I, I hope it did. I, I, I did think about this for a long time. <laughs> Please be impressed, you know? This is, this is essentially what, what's going on, right? You are just spinning something, an explanation, right? From, from the table on the left, right? So that's one thing, it's arbitrary. Now, second thing, it is, that's not how the Hebrew language works, right? Hebrew letters spell words. The words existed long before there were Hebrew letters. Right? People were talking before they were writing. Make sense? And it's only when they wanted to put uh, their, their speech in words, uh, in, in, in tangible form, then they had to invent an alphabetical system. And essentially, the Israelites just took the alphabetical system from uh, the Canaanite land, uh, the Canaanite nations, which we learned already. See, uh, knowing the facts helped you to fight the myths. Right? So, in the case of Father, all right, so long before there was an Aleph and a Bet, right, they were saying Av. But now when they want to write this word on a rock somewhere, they need letters. Okay, so, and that, that's what, that, that was what was happening. When you write, you, you, you spell the word based on how it is pronounced. So it is not the other way around. The, the, the word is spelt not because of the 
meaning of the letters, but because that's how it sounds. The letters represent phonetic sounds, phonetic value. Okay. Uh, with regard to the names of the letters, because the letters do have names, and the names have some meaning. For example, Aleph does mean ox in Canaanite language. Bet means house in a Canaanite language. Uh, in Hebrew, we say bayit, right? But in a Canaanite language, it, it's bet, right? So essentially what happened was when they were in the process of inventing the letters, right? They, which symbol, how would you draw that symbol on the rock? And essentially they, had, they came to a consensus, okay, we will draw the, a picture of a house to represent the B sound. And why? Because the, 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 the word for house begins with a B sound. And so from now on, we will use the symbol of a house to represent that B sound. Subsequently and conveniently, the letter was called bet because that's the, the word for house, right? But the meaning of that word itself does not carry to the letter. The letter, the significance of the letter is only its phonetic value, its sound. The, the, the word bet is simply the name of the letter. Okay? And so once, once you understand how language works, suddenly a lot of these myths fly out the window. Okay, so that's the, the three, uh, three myths that I'm covering today. Wait, um, three facts, three myths. And now we come um, and you say, you know, hey, wait, you know, this is, uh, this is Hebrew, right? Uh, I, I'm not a teacher, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a pastor. You know, and this is very far-fetched. Anyway, my, my church people don't really talk about Hebrew. My pastor doesn't say much about Hebrew. Well, fine. Let's take it closer to home. And maybe you have heard the Chinese character truth theory. And Chinese New Year is coming up, right? And you might receive one or two of these images explaining uh, the significance, the true significance of the... Uh, the, the character Fu, oh, if you break it apart, right, it's made up of uh, elements which, which mean God, man, one, garden. Oh, this is talking about uh, Adam in the garden with God, one man in, in the garden with God, right? And uh, I, put the, I put the QR code here because I didn't know if we, we will have time uh, to cover it. Um, so this is a QR code to my article. Um, but essentially, again, this is where History and the facts, when, when you consider it, right, it helps you to deal with uh, such myths, okay? So think, think for a moment, okay? Because the, 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 the theory is that the ancient Chinese people um, created the character Fu because they knew about the story of God and Adam in the garden. That's the claim. But in order for that claim to be true, the ancient Chinese, you are telling me, must have created this full character, right? Think about it. Wait, wait, wait. I learned all the way when I was primary three that the ancient Chinese didn't write Chinese characters the way we write it today. Mm. They were using Xia Gu Wen, right? The original writers of Chinese were using Xia Gu Wen. You, you, you show them this, they don't recognize. So the question is, how did the ancient Chinese write the word Fu? And this is how they wrote it. They wrote it in various ways, right? But notice that none of them support the theory that the, the word Fu means something like God, one man in a garden. Where, 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 is, where, where is one man? Where is garden? Right? Now, so what is the significance of the Fu character? Why did the ancient Chinese write the Fu character in this way? Well, I, I am no Chinese scholar, right? Um, my expertise is in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. So we'll let the Chinese scholars tell us. Reasonable? So let's just pull a leaf from the textbook. And here it says, and I, I don't read Chinese very well. Um, and yeah, maybe this is kind of blur. Let me just enhance it. And essentially, this textbook, all right, reflects the, the findings of Chinese historians and archaeologists. And they tell us, that the original Fu character uh, was supposed to look like uh, two hands bringing an urn, an offering to the altar. Okay? 
So now, once you know the facts, all right, and once you see the facts, look at how the Fu, we find, we find these Fu characters written by ancient Chinese on, on stones, you know, on inscriptions and everything. This is how they look. And this is, this is the, uh, the original significance. Uh, this is the reason why the Fu character is made the way they did. And it is only much later on in history that uh, we find it the way we, we write it today where we can conveniently take it apart and you know, have some theory about uh, one man in the garden with God. Okay, so you ask, okay, um, how serious are these myths, right? Why, why, why do we learn it? Why should we stay away from it? I think reason number one is because myths are not true. As Christians, we are people of truth. And if we are a pastor or teacher, all the more we should teach truth to our people. And the Bible tells us that we should have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths, but rather train ourselves for godliness, which tells us what? Myths and propagating myths are antithetical to godliness. And in the context of Timothy, you know, there, there weren't Chinese character myths around, but, you know, there, there were probably some Jewish myths running around. And, and uh, Paul writes to Timothy, have nothing to do with it. It's not true. It does not build godliness. Reason number, number two, myths bring disrepute to Christ. Right? And this is a, a, another example of a myth. Uh, maybe you have heard of it before. The Aleph Tav is Jesus' signature. Now, if, how, what do you think? How do you think an Israeli Jew will be thinking if he hears this, the Aleph Tav is Jesus' signature, what do you think they'll be thinking? The Israeli Jew grew up speaking Hebrew as his primary language. And then now, someone else tells him that the Aleph Tav is Jesus' signature. He'll be, he'll be laughing all the way. Yeah. Yeah. And what would he think of Christianity if he, if he perceives that this person is a Christian pastor, a teacher? Christianity must be built on lies. They have to stoop so low as to lie about my language in order to prove to me that Christianity is true. They are so desperate. Christianity must have nothing true to offer. And so because of these myths, con con consider, consider the, the implications. Because of these, these myths, Israeli Jews are turned away from the gospel. And this is real, by the way. Okay? Um, the current modern Jewish, one of the strongest um, modern Jewish uh, polemic against Christianity is that the Christians don't know Hebrew. They mistranslate words purposely to put Jesus in the Hebrew Bible to deceive us to convert into Christianity. That, obviously, that's not true, right? That, so that itself is, is a false accusation. But these myths solidify such a perception of Christians. Let us not be found propagating such myths. Thirdly, myths disarm Christians of discernment. If we are a pastor or a teacher or someone influential and we, you know, we write these myths or we, we, we teach it, when our disciples, when, when our followers hear about these myths, hear about maybe similar myths from other perhaps not so true teachers with not so good intentions, they're going to say, mm, this sounds legit. I've heard my pastor say such things before. And you may lose. Please, please consider, please consider the implications, right? That people may be turned away uh, into false teaching because we, even though we are solid Bible-believing Christians, but because of the myths that we propagate, we disarm um, our fellow Christians from being able to tell um, fact from fiction. So um, that is where um, I'll leave us today with that thought that, you know, we are studying Hebrew. And that's excellent because the Bible, the, the Jewish scriptures were originally written in Hebrew, right? And I like, I like uh, how um, Chris prayed for us just now that we would study to plumb the depths of scripture so that we may understand God and know him better. By it. But as, even as we are studying Hebrew and teaching it, let us do so 
in a way that is reasonable, honest, and God glorifying. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Brother Asher. Okay, I'm very sure thank you. every one of you is so much, you know. Oh, I, I, I'm in awe, you know, of your, your talk because uh, you talk about the meats and I never knew about such meats. And you stress the point about the importance of preaching uh, the right facts. And I think uh, many people are mystified. And like you say, you know, many people think that Hebrew is uh, the, that holy language, you know. And uh, I, I find it so illuminating. And actually, uh, I really like your insights into all these myths. And uh, I, I hope, you know, perhaps uh, we can have you again uh, for talks in the future. This is so, so interesting. Really, really, really interesting. And I really hope uh, uh, all of us are being inspired, you know, uh, to maybe go deeper into these uh, old languages and uh, to study the Hebrew language and perhaps go into Greek, yeah. Um, and uh, I, again, I hope you uh, you have re uh, stirred our interest in Hebrew and uh, re reignited the passion in some of us because uh, I think many people uh, go into the learning of Hebrew. Uh, they go with the bank and just as fast, you know, that passion just dies off. You know? So many people, yeah, they just go in and then for a short while. And after that, that's it, you know, just uh, go off. So uh, I really hope this has inspired, inspired uh, many of us to, to reignite our passion. Uh, I really, really thank you for this talk. And now we are open for a Q&A session and I call upon Chris Lam. Uh, she's the moderator for the Q&A session. Uh, Chris, Chris Lam. Over to you. Hi. Uh, for those that uh, who, uh, yeah, I'm Chris here, Christina Lam here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For those that who would like to ask question, uh, you you may like to type it while uh, type it out as well, and uh, or may, may also ask Asha directly. Maybe uh, can I suggest go through the chat? There were some. Earlier questions there. Earlier, okay. Uh, Wait, I can read one from Paul, Paul Mahendran, Pastor Paul. Um, wait, he is, uh, oh, okay. He asked what the Israelites were speaking before they, um, were, what, before they met Canaan? Or because before they entered the land of Canaan? What yeah, we, I think before they became Canaan, yeah. Right. That was, and then, I would think that they would be speaking Hebrew as well, uh, because remember the first, um, well, actually I, did, I didn't cover this, uh, but the, the first instance of Hebrew speaking we have is that when Abraham entered the land of Canaan, right? And then uh, we find uh, his grandson, Jacob, speaking Hebrew. Uh, there was this incident where uh, Jacob builds a pile of stones mm -hmm. uh, as a witness with his uncle Laban, right? Laban, being an Aramean, just like Abraham, right? He named the stones Yegar Sahaduta in Aramaic, a pile of witness. Mm -hmm. but Jacob, when he names the stones, he names it Galaed. It's Hebrew. That's yeah, how it says. And mm -hmm. that's essentially, oh, I would maybe, maybe it's not right to call it Hebrew then, right? Maybe Canaanite, right? Because, <laughs> yeah. So it's still a Canaanite language. Right? And I don't know, at this point, I am still fighting with myself whether to really call Hebrew separate from the Canaanite language. Was that inscription by the Moabite king really the Moabite language or was it just Canaanite? And were they all speaking the same language? I, I think that that is actually a, a very plausible um, possibility as well. All right? So we have, ever since Abraham entered the land of Canaan, it seems to me that uh, his descendants started speaking Canaanite, right? And then uh, the Israelites, when they were in Egypt, before they entered the promised land, they would be speaking Canaanite slash Hebrew. There's no difference, right? And then when they entered the land of Canaan, they, and probably be, be, it is because of their uh, long separation from, you know, the Canaanite lands that we find Hebrew with somewhat, but not so much difference from uh, the Canaanite languages. Yeah. 
hope that answered the question. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Um, maybe we can go to the next one. Um, I think I see Angie's question. The for the purpose of what is the purpose of uh, studying biblical Hebrew for those who actually do not intend to preach? <laughs> this, is, this is the inspiring bit. Yeah. So I mean, purpose. Well, why was why does anyone study Hebrew for that matter? Why is Hebrew study? I think I'll, I'll frame the question like that. Uh, yeah. Why why do um, scholars still bother to find out what Hebrew words mean and advance the the uh, international knowledge of the Hebrew language? Why? And I think because it, it is because um, the Bible came in that language. God inspired the Jewish scriptures in that language, right? And anytime you do a translation, you lose something. Inevitably, you lose something. You may translate something word for word, but you're still losing something. You are still losing the cultural background behind the word. You are still, you are, you are still losing the, uh, the use of that word throughout the corpus, throughout the Jewish scripture. Uh, you are still losing the rhetoric, the way, the manner of speech, which uh, you know, the, the, the original writer was intending to convey. So I think even if you are not teaching, right, you can still learn Hebrew for the purposes of self-enrichment. You learn it so that you can, you can read the Bible uh, in, in Hebrew for yourself and you can, see all, uh, you can see what the writer is doing there and you can appreciate it and you can come to appreciate uh, that God is the one who superintended that the writer wrote it this way and what does that say about the character of God? All these things are wonderful things to explore even if you won't be teaching anyone else. We have more questions than this. Oh. Maybe we are all still in awe. No, somebody is speaking, but very soft. Eh? No, I was... just, I, okay, can I go ahead and ask? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, hi, Asha. I just want to know, you said that there, is, uh, there was the uh, Hebrew spoken in the Northern Kingdom, the Southern Kingdom, and then after that, um, it got, uh, like when it came to the Roman rule, then there was Greek also added. So now with the uh, present Hebrew Bible, how did they arrive at the consensus that now everybody, uh, all those who are Jewish can read and those who are learning uh, Hebrew also can read. So how did they come to this consensus of having it? Hmm. Of having it. So this one, uh, if you're talking about having the scriptures, is that it or uh, the consensus? That yes, we... yes, the scriptures, the present day scriptures, the right. present day so, Hebrew yeah, scriptures. So this one will uh, take a, a talk, which is like <laughs> another talk altogether. But in summary, um, as a Christian, I see Jesus affirming the scriptures that the Jews had at the time. He never debated anyone on what is or is not scripture, right? So it seems that there was a consensus already. And if Jesus affirmed it, then as a Christian, I affirm it. Yeah. Um, and so uh, if you look at the, if you have a copy of the Hebrew Bible, you just turn to the contents page, you have 24 books there, mm -hmm. right? Which, is, which are essentially the same 39 books we find in our English Bibles. And the reason for the difference is because of how they count the books. Uh, in our English Bibles, we have 1st and 2nd Samuel. But in the original Hebrew, it's just one book of Samuel. First and second Kings, one book of Kings. Isaiah and Nehemiah, one book. And Chronicles. Yeah. Chronicles, one book. Twelve prophets, one book. So once, once you consider all of that, the number goes down to 24. Hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So that's, that's as intact as it can be then. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I think I think I, I know why you say we are not going to canonization or That's and all an that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Really want like, good, you know, but, yeah. okay, there is another question here uh, by Shalom. He said that throughout Old Testament, Aleph uh, at, at, at was found. 
was found and left untranslated in English. Why? What does uh, a left tab actually mean? What does a left tab actually mean? Uh, this one you will, if, uh, I believe uh, all of you will cover it at one point of time, what the left tab mm. means, right? Uh, <laughs> it, it is left untranslated in English because there is no equivalent feature in the English language. That is it. But the left tab is still used even today by modern Israelis. Oh, because of the grammatical. Fancy that. Yeah, because it's a grammatical. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Confuse so yeah. people like us. <laughs> <laughs> So it is not some special, you know, uh, word that no one knows the meaning of. Every every Hebrew speaker, from a baby, knows this. You can, you can watch my latest video. I actually show oh. a children's book with the Aleph Tav there, <laughs> and I try to spin uh, a special explanation from that. <laughs> but yeah, even children know what the Aleph Tav is. It is not something special. It is a feature of the Hebrew language. Yeah. So. You know, so in Hebrew, uh, you know, our left tough, what, what does it mean actually? What does it actually mean? It is a direct, uh, it is a definite direct object marker. So for example, if I want to say, I love my phone, all right? In Hebrew, I would say, ani ohev et telephony. Ani ohev et, that's the left tough, telephony. I love a left tough, my phone. Right, because the action of the verb loves is being done to my phone. So Hebrew grammar requires that you say that you put the left half there. Ani ohev at telephony. Oh, but but why is it when it when it come when it come to English, uh, you know, Old Testament, uh, it was left untranslated. You know, for every time uh, where where a left half, uh, 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 you know, exists, it was just uh, you know. Left, left blank. You will find this also in children's books in, in Israel today, right? You will see the Hebrew text there. And then when you look at the English, the Aleph Tav is also untranslated. In a children's book written by non-believing Israelis. I see. Them. Yeah. So it is just, it is untranslated in English because there is no equivalent feature in the English language. Now, it will be translated in, say, French or German. Because those languages uh, contain a feature Literal. where uh, it's called the accusative. So in Latin also, you will see the aleph being translated as the accusative case. All right. Uh, essentially, it, it indicates what object the verb is being done upon. I love, what do I love? My phone. All right. English used to have, I think, if I remember correctly, old English used to have some way to translate that but modern English does not. And that is why in modern English, the Aleph Tav is not translated. But, but would, it have, uh, would it have anything to do with what Christ said? I am the Alpha, I am, I am the Omega. Because mm -hmm. Alpha is the first letter in Greek. Omega is the last letter in Greek. And so is Aleph, the first, the first letter in Hebrew. Tav is the last, le uh, tav is the last letter. So does it mean that it it point to it point to G, it actually points to Christ? All right. So consider this: what Jesus actually said. Open your Bible. Go to Revelation chapter one verse eight. Read it fully. He doesn't just say, "I am the Alpha Omega." He doesn't say that. What does he say? "I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Alpha, the Omega," and then he carries on, "the beginning and the end, the first and the last." So once you read the verse in its entirety and in its context, it becomes very clear that Jesus was not saying, I am the left half in, you know, that is mysteriously found in the Old Testament. No. Right? Again, it is very important to read the Bible, Bible passages in its entirety and in its context. We can't just take one part of one verse and then build an entire system of uh, you know, beliefs around it and override Hebrew grammar, <laughs> right? That's, that's not honest. That's not reasonable. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ms. Tanyang for coming. Uh, no more? Oh. There was one question about uh, whether Jesus spoke. 
whether the New Testament was written in Hebrew? Uh, there uh, was oral question. I think someone asked, right? Yeah, would, uh, would that person like to ask again? So uh, to refresh our memories? Who said who asked that question? Uh, I, think, uh, I think it was possibly Marshall again. Okay. Oh, uh, oh, no, could I ask? Could I ask a question, please? Yeah, I, you know, I, I just, I am just curious, you know, uh, yeah, is it possible that Christ could speak Greek very well? Almost certainly. The reason being that Greek was the international language of the world during that time. Look at us. Ethnic Chinese people. You know, I, I don't know who would think, oh, they are Chinese, they must be speaking Chinese to one another. <laughs> no one thinks that. That's racist, <laughs> almost, right? Look, look, at, look at us speaking English. We are speaking very fluent English because we grew up speaking this language. So I think Christ would have spoken very fluent Greek. Um, Peter, Paul, the apostles would have spoken very fluent uh, Greek. And if anything, I, I think, you know, uh, their Hebrew might mirror my Chinese. Even though I'm ethnic Chinese, my Chinese kind of, nah, right? And it could be, it might be the case that, you know, to them, Hebrew was just a liturgical language. And they didn't really speak it. But Greek, oh yeah. And we find indications of this throughout the New Testament, right? I, I give you one example here, mm. Petros Petra, right? Where the pun only works in Greek. Oh yes. What if Jesus was speaking? Yeah. So you are, you know, are, are, are you then saying that uh, uh, when Jesus read the read the parasha, uh, uh, you know, in a synagogue, all yeah. the time he would read it in Greek. Okay, so again, different synagogues will have different ways of doing things. Okay, um, so there are synagogues. You know, we we even dug up uh, uh, a synagogue plaque, right? That, that dedication plaque. It's written entirely in Greek, <laughs> right? Oh, so, wow. and, but at least in this instance, when we see him reading in uh, Luke chapter 4, right? You compare the texts. He's not reading from a Hebrew text, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the text that he reads more closely conforms to known Greek versions of Isaiah 61. And so this leads me to think that uh, Jesus was reading from a, a, a Greek text in this instance. In other instances, I don't know, right? But my, my point here was that even synagogues had no qualms. They didn't have a problem with reading holy texts in the Greek language because they did not think, they did not exalt the Hebrew language to some special holy status. That was my point. Can I just, can I just add yeah. a, a couple of points here? One is... Uh, Greek was the lingo franca of the day, so Greek would have been used widely, and that is the reason why the Septuagint uh, was trans I mean, was a translation from the Hebrew text to Greek, some three hundred years before Christ, and so Greek was used extensively. Okay, but I think uh, actually I think in the synagogue they would have uh, used as much as possible the the Hebrew text, the Hebrew text, and only the Hellenist. Okay. The context is also the uh, the Hellenistic Jews, you know, in other parts of the the, the world, they may use the Septuagint for uh, the reading in the, the synagogue. But I think in 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 Israel itself, where Jesus was, I think they were using Hebrew. Um, so that could be the reason why. Uh, okay, the reason why um, you know the English translation was follows very closely the Greek text. Is because uh, the English translation makes use of the Septuagint uh, for the translation, and that could be the reason why uh, we are actually looking at the English text very close to the to the Greek text. But it doesn't mean that uh, Greek was actually used in the, the Jewish synagogue in Israel itself. I believe they would have used uh, Hebrew. Of course, I mean this is uh, a difference of opinion. Nobody knows exactly, you know. Unless we were, uh, we go back to you know year, uh, you know, thirty A.D. Like, you know, to actually see that, but I think um, uh, they would have used uh, Hebrew in uh, in Israel itself, like synagogues in Israel. 
It's a bit like the current uh, debate on the King James only movement and the non <laughs> and yeah. the rest of the world. So yeah, like you said, unless we can go can right address, back. Can you address something? Because, uh, so yeah. you said the, uh, the English is translated from the Septuagint. Um, that's uh, not to, to, no, 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 to some extent, it, it refers Latin to the Septuagint. Vulgate. Yeah. No, uh, notice so the English is like ESV, right? That's immaterial, yeah. that's translation. But if you look, I have actually put up the Greek text of Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Right? Okay. So, yeah. uh, so that's the Greek there. Okay? The, the Greek text of Luke chapter 4, verse 18 matches more closely, not exactly, but more closely known Greek um, versions of Isaiah 61. Right? So it's not the English translation. I am not arguing from translation here. Uh, no, what what I mean is uh, the the reading itself on on that day when Jesus read it could have been in Hebrew, with, with knowing that um, you know in, in Israel they would use uh, Hebrew as the the so called the sacred language in the synagogue. But when they did the translation or not the translation, when they wrote the New Testament in Greek, that was the lingua franca, they actually uh, referred more towards more referred the Septuagint more, and that's how we get this. Uh, uh, text. Uh, that's why if you compare this Greek text from Luke 4, 18, it will be closer to the uh, Septuagint. So, yeah, um, so that, that is, that's my point. Is it? I understand. I understand. So the, the point yeah. seems to be that in the synagogues, they must have read Hebrew. No, uh, in, in Israel itself, not, but outside yeah, of Israel, they may use uh, Septuagint. So, yeah, so that's where I, I like to push back a little bit because the evidence does not point us in that direction. Right, we do have something like that in Jewish tradition, right? That in Israel it must be Hebrew, but those are all very late Jewish traditions, and we must not assume that those late Jewish traditions are an accurate representation of uh, the realities uh, during the time of Jesus. And so, uh, and so when we consider the closer, the closer evidence, evidence that is closer to the time of Jesus. Um, we, we actually see that uh, they were more, uh, they were actually keen on reading uh, in Greek and they did not have a problem with that, right? But then again, this is a, is looking at the evidence and seeing where the evidence points you, right? And until I see um, evidence that tells me otherwise, I would have to default to my current position. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I believe Jesus were taught in Aramaic. That was the spoken language of the day. But the reason why the reason why the New Testament was written in Greek is because Greek was the lingua franca, and they used specifically Koine Greek, which is a simple uh, Greek. You know, because that, that that boils down to the question of whether Hebrew is a holy language, or, you know, is the mother tongue of God, or not. Okay, because Greek was actually used uh, by God to communicate with the rest of the world. And that because, is because it was an international language, the lingua franca of the day. So God actually cannot be confined to just one language. Yeah, I think that's something that uh, you have uh, said very well as well. Uh, should not be. We should not think that uh, God's mother tongue is Hebrew. God uses all languages, whether it is. That's why I find I sometimes find it very amazing. Some people can 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 champo champo, you know. Uh, <laughs> English and then they put the Hebrew uh, text, you know, Hebrew words uh, like Yehoshua instead of Jesus. I mean, if you are writing, if you are writing in the English, just use the English name. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, the name Jesus has been used for for two thousand years. You know, at least four hundred over years are since the King James, right? And there's prayer. We pray to Jesus. You know, so why suddenly the change to Yehoshua? Uh, okay, thank you for all the questions. And uh, as uh, we are nearly, uh, I think that's about all. And uh, we are towards the, uh, we are heading towards the end. Thank you uh, for all the. Uh, thank you for everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we would like to thank all the participants. Yeah. Uh, for. Uh, your presence and participation in this evening. And of course, uh, to Brother Asher Chi, really thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoy your talk. And like I say, I really hope that we can get you to speak to us again. Um, so before we close, uh, may I call upon uh, Brother Stephen Ng?
the initiator of very basic Hebrew, and that's how I got into learning Hebrew. He has been instrumental and in motivating uh, so many of us into learning Hebrew. Uh, the thing now is how do we reignite that passion, right? So Brother Ashachi, really thank you on behalf of the Hebrew teaching team. Thank you very much. And thank you everybody for your presence. Hello.